I welcome you back to our series, Wisdom of the Psalms. I'm your host, Dr. Derek A. Reeves, and I'm very excited about getting into our text, and we're going to read it in a moment, but I do want to thank all of those who have been following us on YouTube and on our website, because it's been a long time since we've been able to record or upload these videos because of building our sets and trying to get our programming together and getting staff together, uh, as well as taking care of all of the duties of being a senior pastor, a counselor, and a teacher. And so we thank God for you being with us and remaining with us. And we want to go right into Psalms chapter 2, uh, or the second Psalm. Again, I am your host, Dr. Derek A. Reeves. And I'm coming out of one of my libraries, and I thank God for you for being with us. Now let's endeavor into our extrapolation of the text of Psalms. Again, this program is not about giving an exegesis of an expo uh, or an exposition of the entirety of the book of Psalms, because that's coming later as I uh, begin a specific Bible study on the entire Word of God. But here we're going to pull out the wisdom that was intended for believers to use in everyday life. And so we go right to the Psalms. Psalms 2 and 1 says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? I want to deal first of all with the term heathen. He says, why do, he's asking a question as if it is unvalidated, if it is not logical, if it is not really sensical for anyone to attack God or to rage against God, understanding that he is the first being, he is the cause of all things. When you understand that God created all things and that God is omnipotent, all power, is omnius in capacity and ability. For you to resist a God who created all things and sustains all things according to his word indicates then that there is a fundamental spiritual problem and a fundamental mental problem or a mental lapse in correct perspective and understanding. To resist God is to be in a place where there's no winning. How can you win against a God who you can't touch, you can't see, you can't contend with, that holds you together by his very word? He is the commander of all things. He is the first mover of all things. And although the trend is to decry that there is no God, we have to go back to fundamentally understanding that even the scripture says that the heavens declare his glory. The heavens give an expose of the creative wonders and the creative genius of God. And we don't want to get into ontological examinations or ontological analysis of reality, not at this point in time. But we do understand that the scriptures indicate that even a fool can see that there is a God when we looked directly at existence and substantial reality. And so David says, why then do the heathen? He's, he utilizes the Hebrew word goyi, and the word goyi simply uh, means a foreign nation, a nation that is gentilian, a nation of individuals who have not entered into covenant, who have not entered into relationship with God, and they don't know him from a loving fellowship perspective. And so we can see here then that if an individual is not in fellowship with God, if they have not come to know him in a relationship where he now extends his presence and his will to them, and he extends goodness to them, 
for the purpose of enjoining them to his family. And of course we know that the goodness of God reigns on the just and the unjust. It's not that uh, only believers can breathe the oxygen and be free from asphyxiation, but God allows every creature, God allows every individual to maintain life and health. And so here we see in the Hebrew, goyi, a foreign nation. And so David is asking the question, why is it then that foreign nations are raging against God? And so we as believers must come to understand that people who are not in covenant may not understand our belief system, may not be able to agree with our belief system, and they may not understand why you do the things that you do for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the kingdom. It's a sad day in the church when individuals who say they are spirit-filled don't understand why we pray, don't understand the importance of prayer, or don't understand the importance of linking in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, why then do the heathens rage? And here the writer, presumably uh, David, it's believed that David wrote this in his experiences, he utilizes the word ragosh. Ragosh means to be in a turmoil or to have literal anger. Does it make sense for an individual who understands the probability that if there is a God, then this God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient, which means you can't surprise him, which means you can't contend against him and win, which means he knows the end before the beginning, and this God who dwells beyond space and time is so much more elevated and so much more majestic in his being that it is impossible for us to do anything with him and to violate his law is to bring about condemnation and disaster to those who do so. And so he says, why do the heathen rage? Why do they even come to any type of understanding that they can contend against God and win? Why is it that they're so angry against God and the people of God and those things that God has established? One of the reasons, again, he's indicating a state of affairs and a condition that those who are non-believers can't escape. The human mind cannot resolve something unless it experiences it in the light of its reality and its human nature to desire to rule and to reign. This is something that God placed within man at the inception of his creation. And so man falling, Adam sinning and coming into the condemnation where he's ex uh, separated from God and estranged from God, he now retains some of those elements of his nature, specifically, specifically, excuse me, those that drive him and his behavior. And one of the basic behavioral uh, instincts that drives him is that capacity to have dominion. It is written and forged upon the heart of man to have dominion and domains. And so he says, why do the heathen rage? As a believer, you cannot expect unbelievers to accept your premise, to accept your position as a God. You can't even expect them to agree with you or to desire to agree with you because it's two antithetical things that will clash. And so we have to come to the position where we understand the things of God will only be cherished by those who understand God. The things of God will only be embraced by those who are born again, who understand the reality of God, who are in covenant relationship with God. We seek to adhere to his word because we love him 
because we understand the reality of God. We understand his love that was committed towards us. And so our love for him is a love that is ever growing because he's ever revealing more about himself. And this is why we can trust him even though in the world many things seem to be going awry. True biblical faith is not believing simply to be made rich, simply to have an extravagant business that becomes global, to walk in perfect health all the time and to have no issues, no problems. The scripture says that the days of man are few and in them they are full of troubles. So every day you can expect some antagonistic thing to come against you. And it's not because God is fighting against you. Neither is it because God doesn't care. But we have to understand the legality and the protocols of God and the protocols of a celestial and universal um, setting that now is the premise and the foundation. It is the place of a cosmic war and this cosmic war, again, has protocols. It has positions. And God, he can wipe it all away. But the understanding and the knowledge and the conceptions that angelic beings and other beings experience, they will still have questions. And so through the wisdom of God, he's allowing this cosmic war to take place. He will inevitably win it, but through it, he is instructing those who have yet to come. He's bringing them into a fruition of a relationship with God. And he, at the same time, is teaching us the rules of engagement, the rules of power and authority, and he's preparing us to rule with him. So why do the heathen turmoil? Why do they war? Why are they vexed in their hearts against God? Why do they seek to oppose anything that is of God? And that's because they are in fellowship with darkness and they will not embrace the light. It is a very serious thing when we seek to collaborate with unbelievers in the many things and business deals that we do. We have to come to understand that if you are really upholding the bloodstained banner, if you are really taking a stance, and I don't mean to be personally offensive to non-believers, personally attacking non-believers, because it is not our job to decry, to tear down, and to humiliate individuals. But Jesus has told us to share the gospel. Yes, we speak against untruths. We speak against injustice. But our remedy should be from the word. And then we must remember that we too are struggling to climb that ladder to reach a state of righteousness where we can now control and bring our own flesh under a situation where it is yielded to God consistently. And so he says, why do the heathen rage? And why do the people, why do the Hagah, why do they imagine or they murmur in a pleasure of anger? Why do they ponder and why do they meditate and they mutter and they roar? and they literally study, they literally research ways to prove the um, church and God is not a valid belief system. They will spend millions of dollars to decry and to destroy the church because they're not in league with God. And why do they imagine a vain thing? Here the writer says, that what they're doing and the results of all of the studies, the results of all of their pondering, all of their mischief, he says, it's a vain thing. It's worthless. After it's all said and done, 
You might injure the people of God. You might uh, ruin their reputations. You might write laws that will cause things to be illegal. But the crux of the matter is there's coming a time when God himself will stand up and there's nothing that no force in existence can do to stop him. And so he says, hypothetically, why would they even seek to rage against God and hope that they can have any chance at opposing God and winning? Why do the people imagine? Why are they studying? What causes them to even consider in their mind that they can ever contend successfully against a being like God? So we thank you. We're out of time at this moment. I thank you for joining me. And this has been Wisdom of the Psalms. I am your host, Dr. Derek A. Reeves. Join us at the next time. And Jesus still reigns. God bless you.